Hello and welcome to Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Furrow. I'm Karen McCarthy. In this edition, we're talking TAF. With D-Day looming, the crucial second vote fast approaching at the end of June, it's make or break time for the farmers of the Fonterra Cooperative. They've been demanding more information from the boardroom of the dairy giant. Information packs sent out this week with the voting papers. And the sudden resignation of top man Simon Cooper from Fonterra's Shareholders Council. What are we to read into this? My guests this week, Waikato dairy farmer Lindsay Blake, also a chartered accountant who's been doing the numbers on TAF. Welcome. And Lloyd Downing, a Morrinsville dairy farmer and president of the National Field Day Society. Thanks for coming in. Let's kick off with the standing down of Simon Cooper. A bit of a surprise to some people. He hasn't said a whole lot. But what are we? What are farmers to read into this, Lindsay? Well, I, I've always found Simon to very, be a very thoughtful and considered person. And I think he's a man of integrity. And I think he's... Um, I, I think he's put a lot of effort into following the due diligence process and um, ensuring really the precondition of 100% ownership and control is met and he wasn't comfortable that that could be delivered and on that basis he's, he's stood down and and I'm, I'm saddened to hear that he stood down because you know I think he's an intelligent man. Um, Lloyd, he cited his lack of comfort with some aspects of TAF. Was that putting it mildly, do you think? Well, it might have been in his view, but, you know, the council have come out totally in, in support of um, TAF and the board. So I don't know whether you want to read into that any more than what, you know, what you need to. I mean, people have different views on things, and that's why us two are here, but, you know, I mean, just because the chair... I've, if he doesn't agree with it, I mean, he's got two decisions, isn't he? The, fa the, fact the, he's, the fact he's gone and nailed his colours to the mast, but the Shareholders' Council has made it clear it'll stand alongside mm -hmm. Fonterra's Board of Directors come the end of June. Given that overwhelming support, what do you think? Will most farmers just fall in line when the time comes? No, I don't think so. I don't... Uh, yeah, no, I don't think so. I, I think one thing that Simon <coughs> standing down has um, brought a new resurgence, I suppose, to farmers. Farmers are, are I guess, starting to rethink this TAF of... of um, if the chairman was willing to stand down over something as as bigger issue as TAF, and TAF is the biggest thing that's happened to Fonterra in the last 10 years since its inception, you know, farmers are now questioning what is it that Simon wasn't comfortable with, and really now interested in the detail coming out about whether that delivery of 100% ownership and control is comfortable for farmers. Um, what do you think, Lloyd? Well, I mean, I think, you know, when you ask the question, will farmers fall in place? I mean, I say, no, they won't. And I mean, if you look at the negative press that we've had over, in, over the last three or four months, I mean, just about every time you pick up the press, I mean, there's somebody in there against TAP. I personally believe they're punching at shadows. Yeah. I mean, if we go back to uh, global dairy trade, the world was going to end when that came in. And there's a lot of dairy companies internationally now are right behind it. Um, so with this, as long as, as, long as the farmers um, have the vote and the voting is on supply, in my opinion, it's no different if you invest in that um, in the trust, um, it's no different in buying bonds in a in the dairy company. I mean, it's it's not a lot. I mean, it's, very, it's actually it's quite different. I mean, from an accounting perspective, it's actually very different. One thing that you're taught is that um, a debt is a um, a no strings attached kind of approach, whereas equity is always more complicated because you have to deal with shareholders. They have m more interest and influence and. And I think the 100% ownership and control, I think the issue I have with it is, and I've, I've done a lot of study on it, I, I invested some time um, and I understand um, prominent professors on this, Henry Hugh and Bernard Black, they uh, specialise in this field of decoupling the voting right from the economic right. And they describe what you sell when you sell the economic benefit to a share is economic ownership. And that is where I fall over. The 100% the ownership and control can't be guaranteed where we're selling economic ownership to an outside investor. And they, they describe the other side as being an empty vote, a, a vote obviously unattached to capital. So, um, Lloyd, you're shaking your head. It's not right. 
I mean, What's for a start, made? this is this whole thing is new. I mean, these these experts. I mean, this has never been done anywhere in the world before. And as long as the as eh? that's not correct. Decoupling um, voting right from economic benefit has is well known around the world. The, the experts I cited, Henry Hume and Bernard Black, are the preeminent professors in the world on that issue. So. Well, the way I look at it is like this. As long as the voting is with supply, I mean, if the these people, like, if, if somebody comes and buys a unit, a, a unit in that trust, they have, other than the capital that they're putting in, if, the, if they've got no other control, the only thing they can do is take that money out, which will lower the, lower the share price, but other than that, they have no other, um, what would you say, weapon to think of a term? They do have a, they have a very powerful weapon. On, What's that? And that's in the Derable uh, Clause 109, where, whereby they are able to um, uh, roll back the fund. Now, the issue I have with that what do you is, mean by that? well, they can, they can basically, as a take a vote amongst themselves to roll back the fund and at that point you've got a, a situation where you have a fund that's no longer tradable. You've stranded in effect these unit holders and the question will be how long before Fonterra have to redeem those um, unit holders and relieve them of that stranding or if they don't move then government will have to intervene to, to fix that problem. And, you know, they will have to be the white knight that fixes the problem. It, it's so. clear, it's clear. I mean, there's a lot of detail. It's a, it's a complex, legal and a, and a big issue. Farmer confusion, understandably, is rife about TAF. Mm. <clears throat> Very few people seem to understand clearly what this means. Um, I mean, is the vote's just weeks away. How across the detail, we've just heard a little bit of it there, um, how across the detail are people, do you think, how well informed is your average dairy farmer on this? Well, I can say, I mean, I've spent six months <coughs> investigating this. Um, I've, I mean, I'm a detailed person, I apologise for that, but, um, I, you know, I've spent a lot of time, I've spoken to all the farmer board members I've spoken to, Mike Cronin, and it's taken me six months to get my head around this. And... Um, and it's taken me a long time to get some information around this and the clarity around the information. But I really have a problem with farmers having to digest the information, the, the complexity of this situation, digest the information and not have the ability to debate the issue and share the issue with the farmer across the fence and, um, and give that time to digest really in there. Um, Lloyd, Lloyd in do you honestly think farmers, your average farmer, has... Um, is well informed enough to make There's a proper vote. There's more information coming out this week. It, it's coming out quite close to the vote, though, isn't That's it? Only right. a few weeks before. But they've had to. The board has had to do due diligence on this. They've got a lot of experts um, looking at it, and and I believe that you've got to trust our farmer representatives on that board. And I'm absolutely sure that redemption risk is still a risk. Um, we can be led into a false sense of security while the while the payout is high or the milk price is high and the and the share price is low, but if it reverses, if the payout goes down, the dividend will go up, the share price will go up. If we have a drought, farmers will be selling shares. What happens then? The dairy company has to pay them out. Well, I think that's a really important point, Lloyd, you make because actually what what we've got to ask is does this solve redemption risk? The answer I have for that is no, it doesn't because what you have you talked about the control that the unit holder has. They can push up they push up the unit value, at which of course it has to be fungible, which means interchangeable between a share and a, a unit. So if you raise that. Um, the bar of the share value, then of course you're creating another form of redemption risk. And of course that will in fact um, encourage and incentivise farmers to exit the model. So, so in fact you've created another lever to drive up um, share prices, which, won't, and, and which isn't necessarily just about price to earnings ratio. It's for many and varied reasons. You just have to take a look at Facebook and the launch there, where you saw in one day a 12% uplift, and and it crashed, crashed within the same way, day. So very volatile. Very extremely volatile. And I, the issue I have as farmers is that we have a very volatile um, uh, consumer product. 
that we have a lot of things going on in our farm, we have a lot of compliance issues coming, and so there's a lot of moving levers on the farm for us right now, and this, is, this to me is a bridge too far for most farmers. Coming up, Fonterra insists it's evolution, not revolution. Teo Spearings took Federated Farmers to task recently for making ill-informed, destabilising comments about TAF. Is the dairy giant feeling the pressure? More straight talk after the break. Hello, I'm Karen McCarthy and you're back with Straight Talk and our guests, dairy farmers Lloyd Downing and Lindsay Blake. A key concern is, is the size of the shareholder fund, the outside investment units. Fonterra has said it's proposing new size restrictions expected to be, they've said, between 15 and 25 per cent. In your view, what threshold would put the co-op at risk? What does it need to come down to? They're talking about reductions. I, I, I see the greater risk is in having the fund and to my mind the only, the, the better scenario is a status quo environment. Um, it's particularly now that um, we've had this threat of fair value share taken away, taken away in terms of um, Shana Dern has confirmed that that will be removed from the dairy legislation. So we will be able to operate under the situation that we have today. Um, and I would like to see some improvements to the status quo, like, for example, the three-year rolling average. I think that's a brilliant idea, and it would have reduced, taken some of the sting out of the, rede um, the redemption issues that we've had in the past. But Given the demands of farming, I'm just thinking farmers, they're busy enough as it is. Do you think they even have time to digest all this? I mean, they're not, I imagine, avid share traders or money market watchers or experts on the fine print of share trading. That is a problem because, I mean, there's a huge difference between a farmer who does really good production, making really good profit per hectare, yeah. um, and understands what is required in a modern modern world, you know? I mean, it is com two completely different issues. Cru but crucially. I thought the fund was, or my understanding of the fund was so to create a pool to actually have value so farmers could actually come and sell those sell those shares and there needs to be enough in the pool for for tra for trading that's what I was F Fonterra was, has that, to grow that, nobody would argue that doesn't it Fonterra has to grow right. has to move with the times has to endure mm. yes that they've got to do something absolutely I mean and unquestionably we can grow and have grown in the past and but I mean, I think we have been guilty of not doing the prudent thing and retaining earnings. To, and, and had we have done that in the past, I think we would have been in a much better space for the, the perfect storm year 2008, um, where we had the colliding issues of uh, widespread drought and the financial crisis. But we're doing that now, and we have listened, and, and um, I think we've got a very good stable balance sheet. With, uh, it's, our debt to debt plus equity is at 39%, so we can take that up to a, a stable level and grow this company and follow the strategy as Teo Spirings suggests. What I, about if the shares go up to $10 a kilo? Well, a very what do good, we do then? A very good question, because that's exactly what can happen under TAF. And that is that will be bad for our but cooperative. Then it's not, but the cooperative doesn't get affected by TAF, because what happens is, is that if the shares go up to $10 a kilo, they're part of the fund, and the actual company doesn't have to pay that out. What I would like to see going forward is a nominal share, or maybe even a ceiling price share. So we, we go back to our far, forefathers' belief that we leave... We leave equity in this company for the next generation. So we take a, a longer term view on this. That it's not, it's because basically what a cooperative about is about is maximising the milk price. It was never um, meant to be about maximising, you know, your share value or your dividend stream. It's really about individuals coming together and achieving what they couldn't do on their own. And that's what I'd like to get back to, that cooperative ethos. But the trouble is with that, that just locks us in to New Zealand supply. And we were talking before on ca off camera when, when our, our production in New Zealand was probably going to be limited to another 4 billion kilos um, of milk solids. Um, the, the production in the future will be coming from South America. And, and some of that like, could be Africa in the long, in the long term. But There's a lot of competition looming, isn't that's there? That's right. And I mean, we're either going to be a small player 
or a major player. If we, we're 30% of the world traded market now, if those people overseas increase, we will go down below 30%. We need to keep 30%, if not more. How are we going to invest offshore? Yeah. If we do and it's profitable, our shares will go up. I think, I think there's, there's many ways and means to answer that question. I, um, the, we don't need to stop growing. That's, that's my fundamental here. We don't offshore? need to stop growing offshore. No, we don't. Of course not. And that's can the co-op continue to grow without that outside absolutely. investment interference and, and of some sort? Yeah, absolutely. And I think if, if it's about relevance, there are other ways and means. For example, there are, there, there are ring-fenced um, pooled investments that you can so you can grow the business and not put the cooperative at stake. But it's not you know, outside, outside investment. investment and you've got that wrong too because it's nothing to do with outside investment. It is actually growing our business and I mean and if we're going to be doing that even if we have retentions our share prices our share value will go up. It must go up. And if that's the case, and if we invest in like Soproli, which we have already in South America, and if it t turns out as good as we hope, that's where the increased production will be coming from. That means that we could, we would be very wealthy just being New Zealand dairy farmers co-op. But the What's trouble, wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with it. The only trouble is if the share price goes up, unless you can have a nominal share, mm. which I personally don't believe you can, because that means then if a Nestles comes in and says, hey, I want to buy these shares for $20 a kilo, hey, farmers will think, well, by gee, these shares are worth $20 a kilo. We're only getting five. What's going on here? The Flaming Board hasn't been doing its job. Next thing you know, there's a lobby, and you only need 600 Six thousand farmers, or six no, six hundred farmers, to form a special general meeting. They'll say, "Hey, we want to actually we're leaving this co-op, and we want the twenty dollars a kilo uh, share value, not the five or four. So this way, I, they can can't take that to, money out can I, can of I the co-op. They can take it out of the fund. Lindsay. I mean, internationally, you, you've see you see all around the world actually, and other cooperatives that have have gone down this road. You will see a nominal value share. In fact, um, I know Van Beck, von Beckham actually suggested if you must go down this road, it makes more sense to have a nominal value share because because you take the sting out of the incremental well, share. Well, what are you saying, Lindsay? Then for the industry to survive, wet shares only in a co-op run mm. solely by dairy farmers? Absolutely not. not. That? Absolutely not. I think we run with what we've implemented since um, 2008, which is we've got now dry shares. I think we need to keep that at a, at a limited level. Um, we, we need to continue with our retentions. Um, I think we need to use our balance sheet constructively. Um, we've got a 39% debt to debt plus equity, moving that up to 50%. That gives us some breathing space. Remember in 2008 we got up to 57%, the highest in our history, ahead of that, um, you know, the perfect storm year. Lloyd, you've been in, in this industry a long, long time. It's significant. This is a watershed moment, isn't it, for, for dairy farming in this country, which, whichever way the vote goes. Yes, I think there's more of a risk if it doesn't go that way than what there is if it does. But, I mean, because I don't really believe that there's a risk. And, and as it is now, if you separate that fund from the company, the company's here with its, with, with its own capital, and then you've got the fund. And One, it doesn't really matter whether that goes up and down. The company doesn't actually have to pay that money back to the farmers. And that's probably a perceived farmer a problem with farmers because they think, well, shucks, now the dairy company isn't actually going to pay me my shares. It'll have to come out of that fund. I guess we shall see come June the 25th. Coming up after the break, dairy farming in the gun again over water pollution. Fair cop or cheap shot? One of the supreme winners of the Balanced Farm Environment Awards has her say. And the health of National Field Days, getting ready to put on its annual show this month at Mystery Creek. That's after the break on Straight Talk. Welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Karen McCarthy with our guests Lindsay Blake and Lloyd Downing. 
Dairy farmers in the gun again this week over pollution of the waterways. Lindsay, your family was last year named one of, of Waikato's best farms when it comes to consideration for the environment. You picked up the uh, Supreme Award at the Farm Environment Awards. What do you think? Do farmers cop too much flack? I think we've become a bit of an easy target, particularly dairying. Um, and I guess because, I mean, we we produce um, one in four dollars of export earnings, so I guess that, that puts us under the gun for being wealthy enough to sort the problem out. I think we've we've come a long way. We've perhaps been a bit slow mm. off the mark, but we've come a long way, and and we're still pushing on. I think um, I think it's fair to say that farmers have moved on, and and most farmers are about sustainable operation. And actually, it makes a lot of sense to operate sustainably and to keep our nutrients in our uh, on our paddocks as opposed to in waterways. I think we've, we're a lot um, more sure of that. And and at the end of the day, effluent actually is a great way to produce grass. So um, we're getting a lot more clever about how we um, control that and um, the waterways. We want to see the waterways pristine too. I mean, we want, to, we want our children to be able to jump in the stream and, and swim like we were able to. So... Yeah, I think we're moving in the right direction. And um, Lloyd, do you think to... farmers cop more than their fair oh, share of definitely. criticism? I mean, with that program, a lot of those cattle were um, mm. were black and white. Hereford Frisian Cross, they weren't even dairy cows. Mm. And, you know, I used to swim in, um, in a stream just out of Morrins, or Parada Falls, we used to call it. And um, and I, used, I think in those days, you know, the effluent from the fa farms were going straight into the river and we used to swim in it. There'd be no way that I'd swim in it now, not because it's it's probably cleaner now than what it was then, mm. but because we're more aware and all this hype about bugs and all this sort of thing. I mean, the rivers are probably never going to be pristine, but, um, and farmers can do more. We all can, can't we? There was no comment about the effluent the raw human surge that's coming out of cities, like the Manawatu River, um, you know, and there's nobody said anything about that. A lot of farmers have made that point. I think that this is yeah. a, a community problem, not a farming problem. It is, yes. Mm. And we do get a bit of extra flack, but, mm. I mean, we'll deal with it. Mm. Let me ask you, Lloyd, field days coming up, rocking up really quick, an iconic event, and one as familiar to townies as much as the rural sector. You are the president of the National Field Day Society. Yes. How big a deal these days is this? It was a, a huge in years gone by. Is it still, still as big. significant as it ever was? We're totally sold up, over a 1,000 exhibitors. Um, and it's the biggest agricultural event in the Southern Hemisphere. We've just been over to the North American Farm Show Council meeting in America, and we foot it with the best in the world. And, yeah, it's a great event. And I'm really proud of our volunteers and our staff. It's always been where farmers go to find out about new farming technologies. Lindsay, is it still very much about that, do you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we used it four years ago when we were looking at um, putting on a rotary cowshed and we were very keen to sort of future-proof our business. So that's one of the places we checked out the alternatives and we, we decided on the one we'd go with. And so, as a social yeah. gathering, as a chance for people to come from all around and get yes. together, it's nothing like it is I want it to be the centre of New Zealand agricultural technology and that's what it is. Absolutely. It's also big business. How big? What does it mean to the economy of New Zealand, an I event know, like this? I think it generates about 600 million of, in, in, in fun, you know, with that, the money turning over, $600 million. It's not small fry then. Yeah, some of those businesses turn over an awful lot of money. It's great. And, and how's, uh, in this brave new world of the internet where everything is available at the click of a mouse, uh, is it still, is it going to endure? Is there still going to be a place for field days into the future? Well, I think it's going to get bigger because, you know, farmers like to touch and feel, mm. but they also want to look up the internet. So we're going to, instead of being for four days, we're going to be 365 days which is great for us. And what's more, it's international. We're having a lot of... We have 18 embassies represented there every year, so it's getting more of an international focus. Our companies, our manufacturers, need to export. That's the place where they need to be, and that's why they're there. It's a great showcase. Mm, definitely. Listen, we're just about out of time, but uh, last word from both of you. Make it a quick one about TAF. Farmers are getting their information packs at the end of the week, going to the vote in two or three weeks. Last word. I would say um, we put a lot of study into it, read what you're given, 
But ask yourself, at the end of the day, we're a cooperative, does TAF nurture unanimity or division? And fundamentally, I leave it at that. Mm -hmm. I think the farmers need to look at the information, make the decision there, but we, ca we can't go backwards. We need to be looking forwards, and it's a changing environment, and it's a changing world. This has been Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Furrow. Thanks again to my guests, Lloyd Downing and Lindsay Blake, and as always, to you at home for watching. Any thoughts, do get in touch. Just head to the Country 99 TV website for details. And remember, later this month, we'll be bringing you a special three-part series on the TAF issue. More details on that coming soon. I'm Karen McCarthy, back next time with more Straight Talk. <laughs>